It's an hour of the last hour, wasn't it, with Nadine Zahawi and Penny Mordant. If I'm sure you've got lots of questions you want to ask about the Tory leadership contest, but we won't be talking about that exclusively unless you don't ask any questions on anything else, I suppose, is, uh, is the comment there. Right, let me introduce our panel to you for this evening. We have Conservative MP Alberto Costa with us, Kate Andrews, Economic Editor of The Spectator, Alex Salmond, former First Minister of Scotland, and the Imam, Ajmal Mazrua. Um, Ajmal, welcome to... I think it's the first time you've been on Cross Quest. Correct. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we'll come to your calls in a moment, 0345 6060973. You can text your question to 8 84850 and of course you can watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 Tweet at LBC. Text 84850 Cross Question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Right, let's crack on with our first question. It comes from Mark in Hitchin. Hello, Mark. Yes, good evening, panel. Uh, panel, um, as you may have heard, um, Boris Johnson has spent the last few years poisoning our uh, our constitution and our conventions, has blocked Labour's no-confidence vote. Bearing in mind that many of us wanted him to leave because we thought he may continue what he's done before, and bearing in mind that Erskine May, our conventions, say that if the leader of the opposition calls for a no-confidence vote, it must take place. And on top of that, in 1965, almost an identical uh, re uh, request was made by Edward Heath, and that was allowed to go through, because number 10 say it can't. Don't you think that's just disgraceful? And should all the candidates standing for PM insist that that confidence vote go forward? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, but as I understand it, Number 10's justification for this is because the motion that Labour put forward said that there was no confidence in the government and the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And the convention is that it just says in the government. And the government have said, well, if it just says in the government, we'll happily grant it. But Alberto Costa, it's not a good look, is it, to deny the opposition a vote of confidence, whatever the wording. Well, good evening, Ian, and good thank evening. you for inviting me onto your excellent programme. We're surrounded by wonderful panellists as well. Um, and I'm very impressed that Mark has referred to Erskine May. I think uh, all MPs really Do you want to explain be... to our listeners what Erskine I May is? I think so. Erskine May is the Bible of trying to understand the very archaic practices and processes of the House of Commons. And seven years in, I'm still trying to uh, flick my way through it page by page. So, so Mark, um, full marks for, for reading Erskine May. But Ian, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is not in line with convention. So what Labour have put down has been purely party political. They knew that they weren't going to get this through. There's no point. The Prime Minister has... Uh, indicated that he's resigning and uh, accordingly having a vote of no confidence when he's resigned precisely because <coughs> there's been an issue of confidence from the Conservative Party towards the, the, the uh, incumbent PM is a total waste of time. So uh, I'm afraid, Mark, there's absolutely no need. Uh, Labour did it to get this publicity to allow there to be discussion in the media because at the moment Labour feels that it's been squashed out of the media given that all the focus is on Tory party leadership. So it's a good way to try and get attention in the media and that's all they've done it for. Alex Salmond. Well, as Alberta has rightly said, Clearly, everything that's happened over the last few weeks is an incredibly cunning plan by the Conservative Party to dominate the media. I mean, an amazing, a wonderful, wonderful achievement. Hey, actually, you, you expressed it, and I better agree with you very well. I mean, you know, there's a difference between calling for no confidence in the government and calling for no confidence in an individual. Usually, an individual minister, what you do is you try to cut their salary, which, mm. you know, there's an ample a, opportunity. And nor should we be surprised that Boris Johnson wouldn't do the decent thing. I mean, he's spent a lifetime not doing the decent thing. If you show him a belt, he'll hit below it. I mean, so why should he be any different in his last few weeks uh, in office? I have to say, I don't share this excitement about uh, uh, drumming uh, Johnson out the door, uh, you know, in six weeks or eight weeks or ten weeks. I don't see really that matters very much, you know, which... A caretaker of Tory is in Downing Street over the next 10 weeks. I mean, what's much more of an issue is another Tory who 
it could be equally bad in terms of policies to the country. In the case of Rishi Sunak, you know, continuity in terms of dreadful policies for the country is going to come in in the back of it. I also think tactically, whatever the rights and wrongs of the Downing Street operation, that tactically, I don't think this is a good move by Labour, uh, because you've got a totally divided Conservative Party. You know, divided among all the candidates, divided about the ousting of the of the leader. And the one way you can get them all together in the same lobby, probably the only way you can get them in the same lobby, is to have a motion of no confidence. Uh, so tactically, mm -hmm. I think it's it's clumsy by the Labour Party. Yes, I, I think an honourable uh, a Prime Minister would have accepted or facilitated the motion. Uh, but then, of course... Boris Johnson is not an honourable Prime Minister. I'm sort of detecting, and the, this this actually leads into a, a, the next question, but I'll just say this now. I'm detecting that you'd quite like Boris Johnson to stay for as long as possible, because the longer he's there, the be, the more people will be recruited to the independence well, cause I in mean, Scotland. Uh, I, I, Why am I being overly cynical, Alex? <laughs> you're never overly cynical. <laughs> well, you're you're really just am. your normal <laughs> cynical. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, just, uh, you know, the... Why change the habits? <laughs> but look, the, I think it is a very important point, actually, not just for the uh, Scottish independence movement, let's put it that way, uh, but for the Labour Party as well. I, I don't think it's a great idea uh, to vest your hopes in the awfulness of the person in Downing Street. I mean, you know, you and I are both old enough to remember when Margaret Thatcher fell and what a, a blow, you know, after people calling for Margaret Thatcher's demise, they got John Major in who promptly won the 1992 election. You know, you're much better to centre your, uh, uh, your appeal to the people and what you're going to do uh, as opposed to the dreadful demerits of your political opponents. That doesn't mean you should be soft on uh, dreadful Conservatives. Of course you shouldn't, but nonetheless, you should base your politics on what you can do, want to do, and will do, and then you're not dependent on uh, on whatever happens in Downing Street. One thing I would say, incidentally, every single Tory cons uh, uh, leadership election uh, in my political lifetime, they always elect the wrong person. <laughs> Unerringly, they elect the wrong person. <laughs> I find it hard to disagree with that, thinking back to the to some of the more recent ones. But um, Ajmal Mansoor, what about this question of a vote of confidence? I, I think if the whole country is saying go, if all the all the fellow Conservative MPs are saying go, the most honourable thing Boris Johnson should have done is gone straight away, given the key and said, you know what, thank you very much, I've had enough. I'm gone. But he's not going to do that, as Alex said. He's going to stick there, stay there for as long as he could. Okay. As, as all other, or virtually all other prime ministers have done in history. I, I'm pretty certain, but I'm talking about honourable thing, and Alex said he's not the most honourable person, and he's proven that. I also don't agree that this is going to get anything out of um, a Labour Party, for, except it's just a show. It's going to unite the Conservative Party more together. I'm just thinking for a second, can I get some inspiration from God to tell me something to say that would be profoundly any different than anyone sitting here? Um, as any mama can tell you, no. The only thing God is well, telling me can. is tell, <laughs> tell this guy to leave, leave the country. I was even thinking of asking him to seek asylum in Rwanda. Maybe that would be a good place for him to settle down and supervise but the But not only the are, you are you an imam, you're a comedian as well. Oh, I'm trying to. But seriously speaking, <laughs> do I expect anything different from him? No. And do I think the uh, Labour Party is going to get anything out of it? No. The country wants a fresh start. And can the, can the Conservative Party really provide a fresh start with the number of candidates? We'll, I'm sure, discuss this. I can't see anyone that would be providing the country a fresh start. Well, I would prefer... Well, Tom Tugendhat's promising a clean start, Well, I would which, which we hear every three sentences. I think, wasn't it you who said fresh start yesterday on your programme? I, I said I thought that was a better slogan Correct. than and Keenstar. I, I, I but think then again, it was one that William Hague used, so maybe not so much. That's old William Hague. I can still remember, yeah. remember who he was. But when he used to be a Conservative. Correct, know. when he was yeah. 16 and gave that speech. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's the country needs a, a really fresh start, and I don't think it's possible. I would have preferred an election, actually. I would have preferred, let's get out and get an election done. Let's see what the public say. I think you might be the only one. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying I could be the only one. <laughs> well, Twitter but wants an election. That's, that's oh, well certainly then. true. Well, so then that's it must a, be right. right. But seriously speaking, can we get anything else from the Conservative Party than what we have already had? No. Every You've got eight different candidates, some of whom had served in Boris Johnson, Johnson's cabinet. But, and again, we, we may come on to this, but 
there, there are at least three of them who could legitimately say nothing to do with me, Gov. True, but they did not stand up and actually raise a hell yes, in How much? Jer- Jeremy Hunt did. Tom Tugendhat certainly Saying did. what? Well, that they disagreed with Boris Johnson. Yeah, but all the things that Boris Johnson has done since becoming the Prime Minister, for anyone to remain within the party and within that particular rank and file and within that discipline, mm. I find it absolutely objectionable. It's immoral. He should have left and said, look, you know what? Uh, if but That's not the way political parties work. I know, I mean, Alex. Look, I understand that, but that's not the point. The point is, well, no, should they is, have done something different? It is the point. They you, should have you done something more different. You can't just say, oh, well, let's, let's all have a group hug. Let's all behave like saints. That's not the way things work in politics. Or should we behave badly? You, no, of but course Ian, you shouldn't behave badly. Ian, David but, Davis stood up in January uh, and told Boris Johnson, and name of God, go... You know, so yeah. uh, some people did. Well, some people, some it people back? did, but no, but, no, no, he didn't. No, 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 most but politi- not. politics, he said it again, actually. politics, whichever whichever party you support or belong to, inevitably is somewhat tribal. And when you're the governing party, if you are a member of the government, okay, you, if you're dissatisfied, sure, you can resign. But I mean, it takes quite a lot for a politician to but come to the conclusion but that but they have to resign, but doesn't Lucy it? Sunak set up part of his website last December so I mean he, he was obviously doing privately what he felt incapable of saying. Well I doubt whether he did that personally I suspect there were elves well, acting it was an over enthusiastic elf. Well it could have been in fact I think I, was, know, I think I know which elf it was. <laughs> <laughs> He's very popular isn't he within the party membership I'm told and um, so therefore somebody could have done it Somebody could have done that particular campaign well before it started. The ir- irony is he resigned, res- resignation by um, uh, Sajid Javed and others followed. Why haven't they resigned? It's the other way around. Okay, sorry. Why didn't they dis- resign before? Well, well there, well, there is a reasoning for this. There's a very practical reason. I thought Erskine May was mentioned as the the Bible of the House of Commons. If you had people resigning left, right and centre, you could not have properly functioning collective cabinet government in this country. We don't have a presidential style system. We've got a cabinet style government, which means that ministers have to accept, and no doubt even in Alex Salmon's illustrious cabinet, ministers have to accept things that they might not agree with the leader at any particular time. Well, you never, don't, never you don't, told me. You do, <laughs> <laughs> well, policy difference is it's, one thing, but no, scandal, but after, think, scandal after scandal after well, scandal... Let's let, believe. Well, right? no, well, let, let, I, I'm, I'm the longest serving member of the committee in standards. I think we need to take a step back about scandal after scandal. We need to be very clear about this as a majority on the committee in standards of conservatives. And actually, you could argue that the thing that started this all off was the report on Owen Patterson. It's got my name on that report. So before we get carried away about the Conservative Party and we need a new election, you should just bear in mind that people like me, many Conservatives like me, said no. This is not the type it's, of deal we accept. It's so, over time that we hear from Kate Andrews. Absolutely. Oh no, this has been great. Just listening <laughs> back and forth. A little comedy routine to my right. Um, nobody looks good. Yet again, right? I mean, the, the Labour Party, I think, were being ridiculous because, to your point, actually to many points around the table, they were going to bring the Conservatives together uh, to support the government had they decided to go through with this motion. Uh, but, of course, Boris Johnson's decided to, to shoot it down, um, which also doesn't look great. And there are technical points about wording here, but I think it's just, it's yet another reminder about how broken the current system is at the moment, how broken our politics is. Um, And, you know, this leadership uh, election is is showing that it is all up for grabs. A lot can change. Unfortunately, it's also one of the reasons it's about to get, I think, really muddy, pretty gross. I mean, it's already getting very testy, the the, uh, the, the, uh, races and and the election. And I think we're in for a really difficult six weeks. So um, it doesn't help anybody. I don't think anybody looks good, but we're used to that, aren't we? Don't they have a uh, cupboard full of skeletons that they every now and again expose and let go just to put one down. There's right? another important thing to remember here, though, from a practical perspective. You know, you, I, I have been a vocal critic of Boris Johnson throughout his premiership. I I was hoping for something quite free market, taking advantage of Brexit, all the rest of it, and I think he's been in many ways a huge letdown. But he did bring in a massive majority. And when these final two leadership candidates, whoever they are, go to the grassroots, they are going to meet in the hustings. Tory grassroots 
Street voters who are still very committed to the Prime Minister. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that it didn't all collapse a year ago, two years ago, is because the man won a huge mandate. And it takes a long time. You have to do so a lot I, I to chip away at that mandate I for it to actually fall apart. On Saturday, I had a hundred of my association members. And when you explain it calmly to them, mm -hmm what's actually happened, that this is not a November 1990 situation where Margaret Thatcher was defenestrated because of policy. This isn't a 2016 situation where David Cameron lost an issue on policy. This isn't a 29 situation where Theresa May had to resign because of policy. This is a situation entirely of Boris Johnson's own making. When you explain it calmly to members, even those that were most uh, strongest supporters for the Prime Minister, they know that when you denude the nonsense and you focus in on the facts, they find it very difficult to argue against that. And actually, what I would say is that the reason that we're hearing fresh start and new beginning is that the Conservative Party is full of talent and we're seeing that talent displayed before us and that the members will ultimately be given that choice to select not just the leader of the party but because we're in governments the next Prime now, Minister. Do you also need UK? to say things though like clean start and fresh beginning and the rest of it because the Tories have been in power for 12 years and nearly every single piece of public policy you point to that's going wrong. It's very difficult at this point to say that somebody else is responsible. It's not to say that, I mean, there's certain things that are truly out of your control. The pandemic, for example. But if we look at housing, if we look at healthcare, it is very hard to say at this point that any other party has more responsibility in, for example, the shortage of housing than the Conservative Party. But well, then it's quite interesting that the three frontrunners, right, but, uh, the, chan uh, the f erst world chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Liz Truss and Penny Morden, were all serving ministers in Boris Johnson's administration till the very, very last minute, till the dying hours when some of them resigned and some of them were still there. So this idea that thus far, at least in this leadership contest, it's the outsiders, the, the, the hunts who've been criticised on the Tuganists, who've been criticised from the outside would have an advantage. That hasn't happened yet. The free frontrunners we're all right in there at the, the centre of things until the very last minute. Um, Alberto Costa, you haven't declared who you're supporting. Would you like to do so on this programme? Are you tempting me to give I'm you an I'm tempting you. I'm tempting you right would you, now. Would your panellists also agree that Tim, I should disclose? I'm very interested. I would have on proposed... The for seats. <laughs> I would have proposed you should have put your name forward to be one of the leaders. <laughs> so I mean, he had more, more, more sense. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, 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 so who's know, your shortlist? I, I, then... Before I give the name, I, I, sincerely, I've been looking at this from an issue of integrity. I've looked at many cases as a member of the Committee in Standards, and I've asked myself... Who do we need that's going to re-establish trust with the British public? As a Tory, I'm asking myself that question. All of the candidates that have put their name forward have no issue personally with standards. They've all followed the rules. But I think the person that will quickly re-establish trust among the Conservative Party members and indeed, uh, more importantly, among voters, we're killing a drum roll now. Must be Penny Mordaunt. Well, there you and go. I'm backing her. I thought you were going to say Tom Tugendhat. But, but you know, it's amazing because I, I was outside of her, but I don't want to betray her confidence here. <laughs> but you're going I, I, to. I, and he was a, he was a trust <laughs> supporter until he heard about it. With Penny, just a few. He minutes. was so impressed by Penny's performance on this show over the now, past Alex, hour. Now, Alex, I've always considered you a man of the utmost integrity, so please <laughs> correct yourself. Enough. Um, well, we had a dissatisfied customer, my friend. Some he says, why are you all having a laugh and joke about this? You're all just as bad as every single politician. Oops. Disgusting. Well, perish the thought that any of my panel should ever display any kind of sense of humour. <laughs> it won't happen again. It's 24 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Everyone.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 25 past 8 on LBC. Well, the breaking news is that Alberto Costa has just declared his support for Penny Morden. I didn't even have time to tweet it then, so I might do that <laughs> during one of your answers, but I don't want to be rude. Um, right, we have with us Alex Salmon, former First Minister of Scotland, leader of the Alba Party. Alberto Costa, Conservative MP for South Leicestershire, who, as you just heard, sits on the Commons Standards and Privileges Committee. Kate Andrews is Economics Editor for The Spectator and a Telegraph columnist. And the Imam and Broadcaster, Ash Masrua is with us as well and being quite provocative if I may say so <laughs> but we, we quite like that Am I not allowed to be? No you absolutely now? are good deal, good deal. Goodness knows what you're going to answer to the next question. Uh, John is in Wallington Hello John uh, Hi Ian uh, hello, hi, What would you like to ask? Well I would dearly love to put my question to the candidates but it's my fault I left it too late so I'll put it to your panel if I may Well there might be some more along tomorrow you never know oh, Well I'll, I'll put it to the panel Okay Given the situation in Ukraine and Vladimir Putin's threats to use tactical and strategic nuclear weapons, should we be prepared to use not only retaliatory nuclear strikes, but preemptive nuclear strikes? Well, let's go to Ashmal. Well, nuclear, no. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we'll all be destroyed in that process. It's so, you're such a wimp. I'm so sorry. It's such a such a silly thing to even contemplate as humans. We, we're the only species on the face of this earth who could have invented a bomb that would destroy us completely and anni annihilate all of us once and for all. I don't support this idea, but I do want to say that um, P Putin is not a monster who just became a monster because he attacked Ukraine. He has done it ever since he became the president of mm. uh, Russia. I remember how he flattened Chechnya, how he uh, bombed a, a Russian um, in a flat in Moscow, um, or orchestrated the war against the Chechens at, at the back of it, how he uh, tested his awful weapons on the civilians of Syria um, by the support of the nasty regime of Iran. I, I, so for him to do what he is doing in um, in, in um, Ukraine, we should not be surprised. He is that kind of a person. He would never think twice. Where we have made a mistake is that we have been very cowardly in standing up to him together as a united front and saying no. And we have not done it decisively fast enough. We have seen too many blood lost, too many people sacrificed and killed. We should have done it when he, uh, um, when, he when he took over Crimea. We should have stopped him then. We should have stopped him when he went into Syria. But we keep on giving him chances. In but we haven't done this time, have we? I mean, the, 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 the West NATO has been more united than I ever thought it would. Which is fantastic, but it's not enough. Too much has been lost already. I know it's strategic. I know it's going to take a bit of time before we regain it. I understand that. But th there is another problem we have, and that is our system isn't allowing us to do sufficiently internationally. We've got United Nations with individual countries with veto power. Russia can veto an action. China would veto an action against these two countries. We have seen our countries do the same when, it, it, when it's against our own interest. America does the same. Unless we fix that international problem that we have, there is very little we can do with the United Nations without much teeth. And the final thing is, I'm appalled by the lack of movement within other Middle Eastern countries or international countries not coming together to say, you know what, we're going to unite against this evil dictator, the most monster that's not only going to kill people in Ukraine, but he will come and do the same in other countries, including the Middle East, including Asia. It's not just a European problem, why, it's a global why do you, problem. Why do you think that hasn't really happened? That, I mean, in Europe, I think that Europe is more or less united. But you look at, for example, the Indian reaction. I mean, it has changed in recent weeks, but certainly initially was, was more or less pro-Putin. You look at countries further afield, and again, they're not taking necessarily the same view that we are. Because they're being given support, military support, intelligence, intelligence support, uh, financial support, as well as economic support by Russia for a very long time. Western Unethical foreign policies have come to bite us pretty badly now. We've been inconsistent, duplicitous in some ways. For example, we've been supporting propping up Saudi regime while they've been bombing the light of the life out of the Yemenis. Why have we done that? Why have we turned a blind eye to Syrians while they've been bombed by Assad? So for as long as we remain inconsistent, other nations would say, yeah, yeah, it's West. When it serves them and suits them, they will jump to it. You know, the initial discussion in the world was, well, this is blue, this, these are blue-eyed, blonde, Christian, European. That's why Europe is interested. 
The refugees were coming from Syria, knocking on the doors of Europe. The doors were being shut, left, right and centre. So the narrative has to change, our messages have to change, and we have to become consistent for justice and fairness for all people in all parts of the world. And in the Middle East, our stance should be, we only support democracy and freedom across the board okay. and we don't sit with any dictators and despots. We'll come to everyone else's answer in just a minute because we have to go to the news at 8.31 with Andy Ivey. The four men and four women who've made the first ballot in the Conservative leadership race are making their pitches for the job with Tory MPs voting tomorrow afternoon. But Sajid Javid, whose resignation from the Cabinet last week triggered the collapse of Boris Johnson's administration, pulled out of the race as nominations closed. An inquiry has found police in the Shropshire town of Telford failed to do their most basic job as sexual exploitation of children went unchecked for decades. More than a 1,000 victims have been identified. The West Mercia Force and council bosses have apologised. Around 125 firefighters have been dealing with a fire in the basement of a pub in Trafalgar Square in central London. 150 drinkers were evacuated before crews arrived and there are no reports of injuries. LBC weather, a dry night for most areas. Tomorrow, plenty of sunshine but a few showers in the north of the UK. A high of 28 degrees. This is LBC. Today. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 8.32 on LBC. Welcome to Cross Question. Alex Salmond is with us, former First Minister of Scotland. Alberto Costa, who's just committed news by coming out for Penny Mordaunt in the Tory leadership contest. I think that makes around somewhere between 35 and 40 supporters that she's got. Uh, Kate Andrews is Economics Editor of All the Spectator and Ashmal Masrur Imam and Broadcaster. Now, we're in the middle of answering a question about Ukraine. John in Wallington says, given the situation in Ukraine and Putin's threat to use tactical nukes, should we be prepared to launch a preemptive nuclear strike, Kate Andrews. We should not launch a preemptive nuclear strike. I would implore John to step back. We, I, I take a relatively hawkish perspective on what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, we, we, we don't want to go anywhere near nuclear weapons. I mean, I think we have two major things we have to do here in the UK. One is to continue to support the Ukrainian government and its people um, with our rhetoric, with weapons, with money, and all the rest of it, so that they can do the best they can to determine their own destinies, that they can fight their war against Vladimir Putin, and they can decide how far they want to take that, and they get to make the call. We need to support them in every way we can to determine their own future. We also need to de-escalate where possible. And by that, I mean us or the United States ramping up talk around no-fly zones or nuclear attacks is in no way helpful to the situation, let alone to the Ukrainians who are the first on the line here, right? If anyone's getting hit, if, if, if the bodies are going to pile up, it's already happening in Ukraine and it's going to happen there even more before it would start to happen elsewhere. So we need to be so, so careful about our rhetoric. And dare I say, even a few leadership contenders have been, I think, slightly dangerous at points with their rhetoric about this. We need to de-escalate where we can. I haven't heard any of them talk about it. No fly zones and things like that. I, I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's a helpful interjection, especially when no one's asking for it. What I would encourage John to do is replace nuclear strike, perhaps with oil, right? If we look at what's happening in Germany still, we look at what's happening in Europe, Putin's still getting close to a billion dollars a day coming from Europe alone when it comes to oil money, right? There's a lot more we could be doing to put pressure on our neighbours before we even think about causing mass destruction on that level. Alex Salmond. I agree with Kate. I, uh, but it's interesting, I think you're right, Ian, that... Uh, the leadership candidates haven't really spoken about Ukraine at all. I mean, it's not been a major. I mean, I suppose feature. it's only been going for like what three days, but uh, uh, I'm sure it'll come up. No, but I mean, but it's not just the the 
Tory leadership candidates. I mean, it's slipping down the news bulletins, yep. apart from the occasional flurry that John has picked up from uh, uh, from Warrington. I should say that we have a Ukrainian MP on the programme on Thursday, so it's not slipping well, down. Well, no, no, no I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that's the case. But the but generally speaking, that's what's happening. As if you know, this is somehow a stable situation. You know, the, the idea that what happens is the the West arms the Ukrainians and they fight the Russians to a standstill. But it's not a stable situation, and it's not a stable situation for two reasons. Uh, one is the obvious the economic impact that uh, the conflict is having, which is you know, ravaging uh, many economies, uh, making a, an inflationary situation which would have been there anyway, but much, much worse. Uh, it potentially is, uh, is resulting in substantial amounts of uh, increased famine across, uh, across the Horn of Africa. Uh, and the, the, that's not a stable position. And secondly, of course, when you've got live uh, hot wars, there is always the risk of escalation in that much, although I disagree with John about preemptive uh, nuclear weapon strikes, but you've always got the risk of escalation. You've always got the risk of somebody pressing the wrong button. You've always got the risk of a ramping up uh, conflict. Now, if the, the strategy is to continue, then the question I would ask is this. Why hasn't the the development of economic pressure basically proceeded since over the last three months. It's almost as if the sanctions are announced and that's it. You know, where has been the replacement hydrocarbons uh, coming from countries which are meant to be uh, friendly with the United States and Britain, the, who could fill the, the void in world markets and stabilise the prices? There have been virtually nothing coming in terms of enhanced supply. If we have been the alternative energy strategies to take away the dependence of much of Western Europe uh, on Russian gas, I mean, this uh, coming week, the Germans are petrified that uh, that uh, the Russians are going to turn off the taps for a week, uh, apparently, mm. to, to uh, for maintenance. So <laughs> the, the strategy is it's almost as if we've done that, we've done the weapons, we're supporting Ukraine against an illegal invasion, fine. Uh, I've <laughs> opposed every illegal invasion regardless of the country, over the last uh, uh, 30 years. But there's no development of the strategy. It's almost as if this is going to be pigeonholed. I, 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 and that's I don't it. remember you opposing what Putin did in Ukraine um, on your RT programme. <laughs> well, the, uh, the RT programme, in, uh, in terms of when the... The, well, maybe the well, certainly in the build-up to well, it, where it was, it was obvious to us all that, that an, well, it was obvious to many of us that in, an invasion was coming. Well, but you, well in, in, in that case, uh, you're uh, you're several steps uh, ahead of uh, much opinion, and to, I, I to me and to, and to many, <laughs> to many other people, it was a substantial surprise. I mean, the the program that uh, that I had, the, an Ofcom regulated. Uh, a broadcaster. It had many programs where Russia was criticised. For example, Peter Tatchell on homosexual rights in Moscow before the World Cup. And we never had any editorial interference. But I must confess that the invasion of uh, Ukraine this last February was a substantial uh, shock. I think it was a dramatic mistake by uh, by Vladimir Putin, as well as being an illegal invasion. I, 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 it was a, a move I did not expect, but I, I suspect I'm not alone is in that, being taken by surprise. If well, only get, you'd I been advising I don't, I don't UK get, Well, exactly. I don't, I don't want to get hung up on this, but just one final question on it. Is there any part of you now, because I mean, you've been very robust in defending oh. what, doing the programme, is there any part of you now that thinks, mm, maybe I got that wrong? No, I mean, the, the, I, I don't... I mean, to me, the, the thing you're responsible for is the programme you produce, whether it's independently produced, whether there's any editorial interference. Uh, I, I don't see there's anything wrong in producing a programme in a broadcaster that's regulated by Ofcom. And that is not what... I mean, stopping people going on RT or any other broadcaster is not how you bring about uh, international peace but people if, behaving if I think, I think would... the very last thing uh, that would be worrying Vladimir Putin over the last few years is whether or not uh, government ministers from the UK were prepared to go on RT broadcasts. But if RT was still going now, would you still be comfortable doing your programme? Oh, because I, I pulled the programme on the day of the invasion yet. Uh, because, as I say, I've opposed every illegal invasion for the last okay, well, uh, 30 years. I just wanted you to clarify no, that, well, because, it, I mean, as you know, whenever you come on this programme, you get a lot of people saying, what are you having him on for with the RT and all the rest of it? Well, so I think it's important that people hear your viewpoint. Well, exactly, and that, you've got a right to ask, and, and, and that would be my opinion, because you, yeah, I didn't see it possible 
uh, to continue your programme in that context. Apart from anything else, if you had been covering the war, who would you have got on to put forward the Ukrainian point of view? You couldn't possibly have balanced the programme in that context. Incidentally, I, I don't think banning broadcasters is the way forward. I think having a sensible economic strategy and above all, trying to find a way to de-escalate conflict before it gets totally out of control should be part okay. of the strategy and not ignoring it, which is what seems to be largely the case in politics just now. The only way the Ukraine situation will end will be in a diplomatic solution. There is no other sane ending to this war. So the question is, will the next British Premier uh, fight to maintain that unity within NATO, but at the same time uh, re-intensify every effort globally to try and encourage world, uh, countries across the world to put added pressure on to Putin's regime to come to the negotiating table and have a sensible outcome to this. Zelensky certainly wants a negotiated outcome to this. So this is the only way it's going to end. The question is when. Will it be later this year? Will it be next year? It's just a question. And, and does that, it, does that, in your view, involve Zelensky having to accept that the, the, there will have to be territory ceded to Russia? So it's not for me as a British politician to tell a politician no, of another sovereign an country what to do with their own territory, but it is patently, blindingly obvious to any observer of this that there is only one way out of this sanely, and that is not to escalate the war, uh, it is to have a negotiated settlement, and that's what's going to happen. But John asked a question about the use of tactical nukes, and I think an answer to John's question is that I do believe Putin would be prepared to use tactical nuclear weapons, but is he preparing to use them? And the answer to that is no. We don't have any intelligence at all that suggests that Putin has been moving uh, tactical well, if we nuclear did, weapons we wouldn't know out, about it. out of... Uh, and I think we would. I think we would. And certainly I've been getting briefing, as have other MPs on this matter. There's no evidence to suggest that he's moving nuclear weapons out of storage. And I think that's a wonderful thing. But I think there is, there is an opportunity here, given that we've got Alex Salmon on the panel, to emphasise why one of the principal reasons that I think that Britain it remains strong by being united. There's only one place to put Britain's nuclear deterrent, which doesn't just protect my constituents in South Leicestershire and the whole of the British population, but is our contribution to the Western alliance known as NATO. And Scotland houses Britain's nuclear deterrent. And if there's one reason alone why it's imperative that Britain remains united, goodness, that's one of the best reasons that anybody could put forward. So, John, well, we would... Uh, we, 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 it's quite I'll, I'll me, many people in Scotland would see that as a good argument for Scottish independence. And incidentally, this is the first time I've ever heard that vanguard submarines have to be located in Faz Lane. Well, there's By no, definition, no a other. vanguard submarine could be a deterrent in Norfolk, Virginia, if I you mean, so uh, wanted. You, or perhaps you, know, you could station you, it in the You were first Thames. minister of Scotland for many years, and you, you, you know fine well that the type of deterrent that we have, there is no other practical base within the United Kingdom. But why do you need it within the United Kingdom? So I, think that's, I think that's I think that's that's a reason above any other reason that we can rest easy at night in the knowledge that Putin isn't an insane man. We can rest in the comfort and knowledge that he would never dare attack this country or indeed any NATO territory. I don't believe for a moment that he's going to invade any NATO and territory because he knows what the repercussions for, for him and his country Has anybody be. been watching the undeclared war on Channel 4 about this sort of cyber war between Russia and Britain? Uh, it is... I actually think it's a pretty awful series, but it's quite chilling in in some ways. I, I, I don't know if you've watched it, Alex, because there's a sort of equivalent of RT on it. I just wondered if it struck any. Thoughts. No, well, I, 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 but given your recommendation, I shall I shall I shall tune in. But you know, the one thing I disagree with Alberto about is this: I, I don't think it's ever been the case that a nuclear war would start deliberately. Uh, the, the worst occasions where the world over the last uh, 70 years has been brought to the precipice of a nuclear war have effectively been in two ways. Either uh, uh, the escalation of a conflict, most clearly the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, or, or secondly, as we know from a variety of research that's been done where uh, systems were failing and uh, detecting nuclear strikes that weren't nuclear strikes. The, the nuclear war is more likely to start by accident than it is mm. deliberately. I wanted to ask you, we, it seems like we're... It's me that asks you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Forgetting the fact that this is the only... This is a man 
Putin I'm talking about, who has used biological weapon, chemical weapons, and we have both, we have all said there is a red line. When he did that, we did nothing, zero. So Putin knows we may scream and shout a lot, but we will lose zero if he was to do it. That's what he thinks. I'm not saying I that's hold on. That's so. what I don't think that's well now. But he doesn't got away with it several actions, times. No, indeed. But after the actions of the Western nations over the last couple of months, I don't think Putin thinks that now. But, he, but he think he about the Syrians, the, the carpet the, bombing in Syria, indeed, the cluster bombing that's in not Syria. NATO territory. I know. What, what he did human do, beings too, right? What, what he did do disgracefully twice in Britain is use chemical weapons against individuals in Britain. Uh, that was uh, um, an appalling situation, but that's very different. It's been made abundantly clear by Western leaders, and I think my constituents would agree with this, that should he cross one inch of NATO territory, he will face retaliation by NATO. He knows that. We have a strong resolve to that. We're united on that. It's not going to happen the way Ukraine is going to be sorted is through a diplomatic act. I agree with that, but I pray okay. your words are true. Y- you're, you're developing a fan club on uh, our texts, uh, Ajmal. Graham says, give the imam his own show. He's great. <laughs> well, and, and the tweet says, Ajmal Mazru is amazing. Please have him on the show more. Then you look at the, twi- the Twitter name, Cynical Robot. So <laughs> I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions on the mental health. Of the I, I was just getting Twitter. excited there. Thanks for that. <laughs> right, uh, we've got a question. Having been a bit sort of nasty to Alex Hammond over the last few minutes with some of the questions, um, we're going to give him an open goal in a moment. 8.47. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Brandon Lewis is, of course, a Conservative MP, very recently serving as Northern Ireland Secretary. How difficult was it for you to say, up with this, I cannot put to the Prime Minister? For me, it was quite sad. I have to say it was uh, quite a tough decision. One of the hardest decisions I've made in politics. Have you spoken with him since? Well, look, we've communicated since. I haven't spoken to him in person since Wednesday night, not face-to-face. I am proud to have, have served in his government. I think we did some great things. We took the country through the pandemic. He's been dealing with the, the war in Ukraine, as well as looking to deliver on that domestic agenda. I'm very proud of what we achieved. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 849. Don't forget, if you ever miss an episode of Cross Question, you can catch up on the Cross Question podcast or on Global Player or on the LBC YouTube channel. Alex Salmond is with us. Conservative MP Alberto Costa, Kate Andrews from The Spectator and Imam and broadcaster Ajmal Mazrua, who's very popular with LBC listeners, it seems, tonight. Let's go to Jeff in Woking. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Ian. I'm afraid it's bad news for the Iman. Uh, Boris Johnson was sent to Rwanda, but unfortunately they sent him straight back again. Uh, uh, sorry, we're not allowed uh, to have humour on this jo- uh, on the show, sorry, Jeff. Didn't sorry, you get the uh, message? I stand, I stand, I stand corrected. Uh, um, Ian, uh, was, are the panel confident that Scotland will be allowed to have its referendum for independence? Um, 
Alex Salmon, give us your view on this, because Nicola Sturgeon wrote to Boris Johnson saying, well, we, we want an independence referendum in October 2023. We're going to take it to the Supreme Court, so um, you can't stop us. He's saying, well, we're not going to give you permission and has encouraged this to go to the Supreme Court. Is this a clever move by Nicola Sturgeon? And do you think there will be a referendum, whether it's official or not, in October 2023? Well, I think it's certainly the, the right move initiating the uh, demand for a what's called a Section 30, that's yeah. the agreed referendum. Which, I, which is what you agreed with David uh, Cameron. I negotiated with David Cameron back in 2012. Uh, I would, halcyon days. And they were halcyon days, yes. Uh, I would prefer to see uh, uh, much more vigour in the pursuit of that because I think people, a lot of people in Scotland are... Uh, uh, well, I've just been showed by Alberto the the uh, the Michelle shaking hands with David Cameron, which is absolutely correct. Uh, and you might notice behind Alberto that's a map of Scotland. The colour yellow w was at the time every single seat. Show it to the camera. Show it to, show it to that camera. Was SMP number three? Number three. There they are. Camera number three. Every it was yellow because every single seat was was held by the uh, SNP, who which won a majority in a proportional system. Uh, the, uh, Alberto has brought a copy of the Edinburgh Agreement with him. My God! Uh, well, then, then you'll know just how sensible it would be in his dying embers of his premiership for Boris Johnson to agree the Section 30. <laughs> You know, we're, we're joking about, about this. But that's look, an, just on that, that's an interesting point because he could have done that. He could, in theory, do that because then his successor wouldn't have to make that choice. But, of course, when the Prime Minister is about to go, they're not, they're not allowed to make big decisions, well, well, are let's they? Let's put it that way. I mean, I was fascinated by the fact in the very, you know, the very as his world disintegrated around him last Tuesday, you know, with... More ministers than a, you could shake a, a, a stick at. With him on the phone to Alberto, begging him to come and be the next uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. With Minister all, for People. All, all of this happening, the one thing that Boris Johnson took the time to do last Tuesday was to write a letter to Nicola Sturgeon saying you're not having the Section 30. <laughs> which I, I Doesn't that show his respect for the well, people of Scotland? Or, or alternatively, it demonstrates that the unionist parties, and by which I mean both Tory and Labour and Liberal Democrats, underrate heavily uh, the sense of, I think, anger and outrage, not about them not agreeing with Scottish independence, but not agreeing what was manifestly voted for democratically last year is being undemocratically denied by Westminster this year. And after the, this agreement, it was the accepted way for Scotland in a voluntary union with the rest of the United Kingdom, which has been an agreed position of every Prime Minister since 19 Oatcake, that the way you did it was get yourself a majority in a proportional parliament in the Scottish Parliament who wanted the referendum. And on that basis, the referendum would be agreed in a civilised way, which I did with David Cameron back in 2012. And to upset that up, I mean, I know that the you know, Tories and think this is clever and they think it's going to pay off for them in the end. It's not. All it's going to do is outrage and inflame opinion. And if any one of the, you know, the, the, the hateful eight, the last eight contenders for the, the Tory leadership would just have the gumption to say it's not a reasonable position to now be supporting the right of the British people to decide what they wanted to do with the European Union while simultaneously denying the right of the Scottish nation to have a vote on whether it wants to continue as part of the United Kingdom. Uh, the, uh, as I say, it's a, a stalling tactic, but in the end it's going to make okay. things much worse for unions. Alberto Costa, there's very little of what Alex Salmon said there that I think any Conservative ought to disagree with, surely, because he's, he's right in, in the sense that there is a democratic mandate for this now, isn't there? You, you can't deny that. So there's a democratic mandate further to an agreement that Alex Salmond made with the British government. And in that agreement, I think it's worth listeners remind, being reminded of what he is. I've got this, the signature in front of me and you can see it says Alex Salmond. And he agreed, and I'll just remind Alex... That's not my it? best signature. <laughs> I, I, I must have been excited. That sounds like that RT moment. But it says, it says here, it says, deliver a fair test and a decisive expression of the views of people in Scotland and a result... This is a key point, a result that everyone will respect. My party's position is respecting the democratic will 
of the people of Scotland. But that was Alex Salmond, in, Alex Salmond, in addition to this agreement, made a very reasonable point. And his point was that this was a once-in-a-generation referendum. And I think the reason that actually gave strength to Alex Salmond's position is because a lot of waverers, and I knew many, when they heard Alex as First Minister saying those really clear and unambiguous comments that it was a once in a generation it gave even greater legitimacy and strength to his we, position but, but we hadn't but, left the European Union at that point and that was what that was a, a key thing that has changed uh, in the last Scottish elections the SNP uh, with their green allies who support independence they got a majority in the seat of, in, of seats whether you like that or not and just just to and say it's not static no, it, you, know, it you accept the result of an election uh, Alberto and then if you get knocked out at the next election, you don't say, oh, well, we won the last election. I, I tell you, no, I, I, I you, know, you did say once in a generation. Yes, it's subject not? to the wishes of the Scottish people. And I don't remember I don't that remember, caveat, and that caveat. Not, <laughs> no, so I, Well, I can, so I can refer you to the interviews and said that the Scottish people always have the right, because they're a nation of self-determination. It's up to the Scottish people to judge. It's not my opinion, or with great respect, Alberta's opinion, that matters in this. What matters is the SNP and the Greens and those who supported independence took it to the people at the election last year and unambiguously won a majority. Right, let, let's get the views of our other two panellists on this. Kate Andrews first. Well, I'm somewhere in between the two of you, and, and to be very clear, I, I, I very much hope that if there were a second referendum, Scotland would stay in the Union, but that's not my decision to make. Um, uh, but, yes, leaving the European Union did change things, and meaningfully so. And I think that is a strong argument that a second referendum should be brought forward. But I am curious to hear from Alex, if a second re referendum were brought forward, how would you define once in a generation this time? Because I can see an endless cycle where Scots continue to vote to be part of the union, but still support the SNP on other policies. And I don't think it is credible to go back again and again and ask the same question over and over can I, can I until you get well, the see, answer you want. Exactly, be brief, because I need to bring In the St Andrews Agreement in Northern Ireland, the St Andrews Agreement, the Belfast Agreement, has a provision for a potential referendum on Irish unity. And it says it can only happen once every seven years. Now, that, that's in the St Andrews Agreement. Now, if people are prepared to say it can happen every seven years in, uh, in Ireland, why is the British government who signed the St Andrews Agreement not prepared to say it can happen every seven years? Are you prepared maybe, to say it? Maybe we should have a Brexit referendum every seven years as well. <laughs> what <laughs> fun that but I mean, are, are you prepared to put a timeline on it? Because it felt like as soon as the Scots did vote to stay in the Union, there was a strong, strong voice coming out saying we have to have this vote again. I mean, yeah. it's easy to pin it on Brexit and, now, and you remember but let's be honest. Thing. It was the use, the use the argument, I remember both Alex and Nicola Sturgeon saying there's been a significant change due to the Tories talking about changing the Human Rights Act. And that was the right. first... There's always a reason for change. No, 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 exactly. no, 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 let's, no, 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 let's, let's bring again, Ajmal, 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 let's bring Ajmal in. I love Scotland and I would, be, I would be very upset if Scotland was to leave the United Kingdom. I am all for togetherness. Uh, I, uh, I actually cried over the fact that we left the European Union. I, my wife is Hungarian, my kids have enjoyed living in Spain for years and it, that has deprived me and I think my young, uh, my children's generation the opportunities that I enjoyed so much. So now, with the last hope in my heart that I want, want to lose one more part of that wonderful land called Scotland, I would wish that uh, Alex Salmon and others would talk about um, togetherness more and make our country, United Kingdom, uh, more fair and just together, not by dividing do we become older. When you say lose what, it, what do you mean by lose one, one, one second. I'm quite interested in this concept. I, 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 I mean, have you got it just now well, to lose? I'm so... When you say United Kingdom, it's part of one union. That's what I mean. A voluntary it. union. Of course. And what I would <laughs> like, love to see is that voluntary union to continue. And also for us to celebrate our togetherness. If there is something that United Kingdom is doing that's not working for Scotland, let's change that instead of severing this relationship. We're on one island. But I suppose the further that, we divide. Listen, I live in the Enfield. That's your entitlement. You, you, you're entitled to say, I want the union to stay together. I dearly love having Scotland and I want it to stay together. 
What you're not entitled to do, or what certainly the Conservative government entitled to do, is say that Scotland does not have the right of self-determination. I've never you said elo- that. Well, well, then said. that is what we're just saying. Oh, no, is not the time. That's, that's all that we've said. My, well, I see, so all my these other countries, all these other countries, which you very passionately have argued, should have the right of self-determination, shouldn't be in- invaded by their powerful neighbours. These other countries... Let's not draw that comparison. That's a bit extreme. No, the right of self-determination is where the ballot box is what Scotland must have. Well, we're, we're right we have, we, no, 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 no. <laughs> we have to end this discussion here because we're going to go over time and I don't want you to miss out on the opportunity of answering our final text question, which I'm pretty sure is almost a repeat of last night's. It's from Jackie in Hartlepool. We learnt tonight that Nadim Zahawi's karaoke song is I Will Survive and Penny Morden's is These Boots Were Made For Walking by Nancy <laughs> Sinatra. What are the panel's karaoke songs of choice? Alex Salmon. Well, obviously, I can boogie. You see, Scotland uh, uh, last year <laughs> celebrated our qualification. Can, can I ask you not to prove for, this. Our, quali- you know, our qualification for a, a, a European Championship for the first time in ages and ages. Now, unfortunately, we didn't boogie quite as well in the World Cup qualification, but nonetheless, we're confident that we can boogie again in the next all night long. In the next football <laughs> European Championship. So well, I can boogie for. Okay. For obviously. So it's yes, sir. I can boogie for Alex <laughs> Salmon. Something that I never thought I'd hear myself <laughs> say. Um, Alberto Costa. It has to be Kate Bush, Withering Heights. That song. Yeah. Somebody said singing. that last night. Well, there you go. My sister and I. Steve are... Reed, you've got something in common. Oh, there we go. 1979. I was in Glasgow. And my uh, voting ambish, against in, in, ambish, no, I was, I was, I was eight years old. I couldn't be voting against. I was eight, eight years old. Nin, Nineteen seventy-nine, and uh, it's STV Scottish Television show. One of the first videos ever of Kate Bush dancing to Wuthering Heights, and my sister. And that's been your my sister and I start to twirl along crazily with Kate Bush, and ever since then we always break into that song whenever it comes on the radio. Dear Kate, um, slightly different than everyone else, uh, I suppose. I love a song that I sing with my kids called Sing Children of the World. It's by somebody called Dowd Wansby Ali. He's an American singer. Um, It's just fascinating. I always, I don't sing to even save my life, but this one I will definitely sing any time with my children. (laughs) On you go. Oh, no, don't even try. Um, Kate. Oh, my gosh, this is so much more wholesome. Um, if I have, if I have like, a good, solid seven minutes, you know, that mic is in my hand and no one's taking it away, it's got to be Meatloaf's Paradise by the Dashboard. Oh, I love that. It's actually yeah. nine minutes, 32 seconds. Look, sometimes they trim it down. They have to, Kate, right? I but... see you in an entirely different way. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, you, you've outshone All that economic <laughs> shit. Yeah, out the window. Out the window. I was going to say, I bet you say that to all the boys, but that's a different bit, <laughs> <laughs> so I won't. Uh, listen, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Alex Salmond, Alberto Costa, Kate Andrews and Ajmal Mazrul. We have another edition of Cross Question tomorrow night at 8 on LBC. Uh, coming up in a moment, we're going to have an open phone in on all the developments on the Tory leadership today. A lot of people are saying that it's Rishi Sunak's to lose, that he will be uh, the front runner. Do you th- do you agree with that? What do you think? Made, what did you make of the performance of Nadim Zahawi and Penny Mordaunt in their interviews with me earlier on in the programme? Well, did either of them surprise you, either positively or negatively? Who do you think is going to be in the top two? Because we'll find that out probably on Monday, almost certainly by Tuesday. It's three minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, eight contenders will be in the first round of voting in the race to be the next Prime Minister. Tory MPs will have two hours to vote tomorrow afternoon as they start...